Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here today. It's my pleasure to introduce Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin III and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley. The Secretary and the Chairman will each deliver opening remarks, and then we'll have time to take a few questions. I will moderate those questions and call on journalists and would ask that we limit follow-ups due to our tight schedule. Thank you for your assistance uh, with that, and over to you, Secretary Austin. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today at Ramstein. We've just concluded the eighth Ukraine Defense Contact Group meeting, and it was great to start the new year by deepening our coordination as we work together for Ukraine's self-defense. As President Biden has said, this is a, a decisive decade for the world. And this is a decisive moment for Ukraine's struggle to defend itself. So this contact group will not slow down. We're going to continue to dig deep, and based upon the progress that we've made today, I'm confident that Ukraine's partners from around the globe are determined to meet this moment. The United States remains committed to leading in this coordinated effort. And this morning, I was pleased to announce another major round of U.S. security assistance designed to meet Ukraine's urgent battlefield requirements. And this $2.5 billion package is one of our largest yet. It helps Ukraine meet its air defense needs with additional NASAMS munitions and eight Avenger air defense systems. And this package also helps tackle Ukraine's urgent need for armor and combat vehicles. It includes 59 additional Bradley infantry fighting vehicles and 90 striker armored personnel carriers, 53 MRAPs, and 350 up-armored Humvees. And it will provide thousands, round, uh, thousands more rounds of artillery. Now, we were honored uh, to hear this morning from President Zelensky of Ukraine. And let me also thank several other brave Ukrainian leaders for joining us today. And that includes my good friend, Minister Oleksiy Reznikov, the Minister of Defense, and Lieutenant General Moyshuk, the Deputy Chief of Defense. Their presentations gave us a firsthand account of what Ukraine's military and citizens are facing. Today's meeting focused on Ukraine's needs for air defense and armor. We also pushed hard on how to synchronize those donations and turn them into fully operational capabilities. And that means every step from donation to training to maintenance and then to sustainment. We also focused hard on how our collective and, and individual training efforts uh, would be prosecuted. So, as you heard, President Biden recently announced uh, the, the latest uh, U.S. training initiative, and it builds on uh, U.S. programs to train Ukrainian troops dating back to 2014. Other countries are stepping up with their own initiatives, and many are joining the European Union's military assistance mission. And meanwhile, we're also continuing to strengthen our defense industrial bases through the work of the National Armaments Directors under the auspices of this contact group. And all of these efforts underscore how much we've deepened our cooperation since the contact group began last April. Our work shows how much nations of goodwill can achieve when we work together. And it shows our long-term commitment to supporting Ukraine against <coughs> Russia's unprovoked aggression. Now, as we saw again just uh, days ago in Dnipro, Russia continues its assault on Ukraine's civilian and, and critical infrastructure. And Russia continues to bombard Ukraine's cit uh, cities with cruise missiles and drones. 
But the Ukrainian people stand defiant and strong. And Ukrainian troops are bravely defending their country and their fellow citizens. As Russia's cruelty deepens, the resolve of this contact group grows. And that's clear from the announcements that we've heard today. And I'll start with air defense. Several countries have come forward with key donations that will help protect Ukraine's skies and cities and citizens. And France and Germany and the UK have all donated air defense systems to Ukraine. And that includes a, Patri a Patriot battery from Germany. And that's especially important coming alongside our own contribution of a Patriot system. And the Netherlands is also donating uh, Patriot missiles and launchers and training. And meanwhile, Canada has procured a NASAM system and associated munitions for Ukraine. And so these air defense systems will help save countless innocent lives. We're also pushing hard to meet Ukraine's requirements for tanks and other armored vehicles. The UK has announced a significant donation of Challenger 2 tanks for Ukraine. And this is the first introduction of Western main battle tanks into Ukraine. And I also commend our British allies for, for making this decision. And Sweden announced it's donating CB-90 infantry fighting vehicles and an additional donation soon of Archer howitzers. We've also heard inspiring and important new donation announcements from several other countries, and, and that includes Denmark, which will donate 19 howitzers. And Latvia is donating more stingers and helicopters and other equipment. And Estonia is providing Ukraine with a significant new package of much-needed 155-millimeter howitzers and munitions. Now, all of today's announcements are, are direct results of our work at the contact group. And these important new commitments demonstrate the ongoing resolve of our allies and partners to help Ukraine defend itself. Because this isn't just about Ukraine's security, it's also about European security, and it's about global security. It's about the kind of world that we want to live in. And it's about the world that we want our children and grandchildren to inherit. The members of this contact group are standing up for a world where, where rules matter, and where rights matter, and where sovereignty is respected, and where people can choose their own path, free from tyranny and aggression. And I'm confident that this group will remain united, and will continue to build momentum, will support Ukraine against Russian aggression for the long haul, and we'll continue to work toward a free and secure Ukraine in a stable and decent world. And with that, let me turn it over to the chairman uh, for his comments. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Secretary Austin, for your leadership in this uh, eighth Ukrainian uh, contact group in support of uh, Ukrainian freedom. And thanks as well to all the ministers and the chads, the chiefs of defense that were here who represented 54 different countries today. A special thank you also to the Ukrainian Minister of Defense, uh, Rizikov, and uh, Deputy uh, Chief of Defense, General Moisik. Uh, I had recently had an opportunity to meet with uh, General Zaluzny uh, in Poland, and uh, General Moisik was here representing him. Uh, they all represent the exceptional bravery of the Ukrainian army, and most importantly, uh, the Ukrainian people. Uh, this week, after meeting General Zaluzny, I had an opportunity uh, to visit some of the training in the mech infantry uh, that we are doing at Grafenwehr here in a training area in Germany. Also, I uh, had an opportunity to do some coordination meetings in Wiesbaden, and then attended the NATO CHADS uh, military committee meeting where all the members of uh, all the CHADS of NATO had an opportunity to meet with one of the primary topics being support uh, to Ukraine. And then, of course, uh, this week, ending it today, this week, with, uh, with the contact group. <coughs> Um, I think that over my 43 years in uniform, uh, this is the most unified I've ever seen NATO, and I've dipped in and out of NATO over many, many years. Uh, the war has evolved uh, over the last uh, 11 months, uh, but the mission of this group, this contact group under General Austin's uh, leadership, under Secretary Austin's leadership, has remained the same. 
We are effectively committed to support Ukraine with capabilities to defend itself against the illegal and unprovoked Russian aggression. In the words of President Biden, Secretary Austin, and many other national leaders, as much as it takes for as long as it takes in order to keep Ukraine free, independent, and sovereign. These contact group meetings play an important role as we support Ukraine in the defense of its territory, and they are a clear, unambiguous demonstration of the unity and resolve of the allied nations. Yesterday, as Secretary Austin just mentioned, President Biden released our 30th security assistance package signifying our continued commitment to Ukraine. This package combined with our previous one includes combined arms maneuver capabilities with supporting artillery, equivalent to at least two combined arms maneuver brigades or six mech infantry battalions, 10 motorized infantry battalions, and four artillery battalions, along with a lot of other equipment. This package, this U.S. package, along with the Allied don donations that were indicated today, signify our collective resolve and our commitment to Ukraine to protect their population from the indiscriminate Russian attacks and to provide the armor necessary to go on the offensive to liberate Russian-occupied Ukraine. Additionally, this week in Germany, we began battalion and brigade collective training that I had an opportunity to visit at the Combined Arms Maneuver Training Center here in Grafenvier uh, in support of the Ukrainian Army. That training, in addition to the equipment, will significantly increase Ukrainians' capability to defend itself from further Russian attacks and to go on the tactical and operational offensive to liberate the occupied areas. With the training that the United States and our partners are doing, the Ukrainians will advance their command and control, their tactics, techniques, and procedures, their ability to integrate fires with maneuver, and they will more effectively synchronize all of the combined arms in order to execute maneuver-based operations. The support that we discussed today in this contact group meeting, the training that we discussed today in the way ahead, is really an extension of what's been going on since 2014. <clears throat> and today signifies a very real and tangible difference in the Ukraine's efforts to defend itself. International aggression, where large countries use military force to attack small countries and change recognized borders, cannot be allowed to stand. Eventually, President Putin, Russia, will realize the full extent of their strategic miscalculation. But until Putin ends this war, his war of choice, the nations of this contact group will continue to support the defense of Ukraine in order to uphold the rules-based international order. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, Chairman. Our first question will go to Ute Spanenberger from ARD. Hello, Mr. Secretary of Defense. My question is, many of us thought that today we will have a breakthrough in the discussion about heavy battle tanks. You didn't mention that at all. We didn't talk about Leopard 2 or Abrams tanks. So did you talk about that today? Uh, I think you heard, uh, you may have heard the German Minister of Defense say earlier that uh, they've not made a decision on the provision of uh, Leopard tanks. Uh, what we're really focused on uh, is making sure that uh, Ukraine has the capability uh, that it needs to be successful right now. So we have a window of uh, opportunity here, uh, it, you know, between now and the spring when I, you know, when, whenever they commence uh, their operation, their counteroffensive. Uh, and that's not a long time, and we have to pull together the right capabilities. And you heard the, the chairman walk through uh, some of the substantial combat power that we and, and some of our allies have, uh, have offer, offered to provide. Uh, there are tanks in that, uh, in that, uh, uh, those offerings. Uh, Poland, for example, it continues to offer tanks and will provide tanks, and other countries will offer some tank, tank, tank capability as well. I don't have any announcements to make on M1s. And you heard the, uh, the German Minister of, of Defense say that uh, they've not made a decision on leopards. So. Thank you. Our next question will go to Idris Ali, Reuters. 
Uh, Mr. Secretary, over the past week, a, a number of European countries have publicly pleaded with Germany to allow the transfer of their tanks. You met with your German counterpart yesterday, and like you said today, they still have not made a decision. Are you um, disappointed in the German position? And how can Germany still be seen as a reliable ally, given what is widely perceived as them dragging their feet on something so simple? And for the chairman, um, is there any prohibition on the use of American weapons by the Ukrainians in Crimea currently? And you've talked about how this war, like many others, has to end through a negotiated settlement. Is now the time for the Russians and Ukrainians to come to the table to talk about that? Um, uh, thanks, Idris. Uh, first, let me say that uh, this isn't really about one single platform. Uh, and so our, our goal, and I think we've been fairly successful at doing this and bringing together capability, is to, is to provide the capability that Ukraine needs to be successful in, in the near term. And so you've heard us talk about uh, two battalions of uh, Bradley uh, infantry fighting vehicles, very capable platform. Um, three battalions or brigades worth of uh, strikers. Uh, so you add that up, that's, that's two brigades of combat power that the U.S. is providing, along with enablers and other things. So you look at uh, Sweden providing uh, a battalion of CB-90s, that's an armored personnel carrier. Uh, the Germans are providing martyrs. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Poles are providing uh, a battalion's worth of uh, mechanized capability. Uh, you heard the chairman highlight uh, four battalions of, uh, of uh, artillery, uh, mechanized artillery that's being provided. So this is a this is a very very capable package, and they you know if if uh, if employed properly, uh, it will be, it will enable them to be successful. Now we're going to uh, ensure that we're doing everything uh, necessary uh, to ensure that they have the ability to employ it properly. Uh, you heard us talk about training, additional training that we're going to do. This is something that we haven't been able to do in the past. So you know as we speak. You know, troops are being linked up with uh, Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, uh, and they'll train for weeks, uh, not only on just how to operate the vehicles, but also uh, on how to properly uh, set conditions for maneuver and then maneuver. And then, you know, how to exploit uh, opportunities, how to breach obstacles. Uh, so I, I think this will be a really, really uh, capable uh, package that we put together. And I, I really do believe that uh, it will enable the Ukrainians to be successful going forward. So this is not dependent upon uh, a single platform. Uh, this is, uh, this is a you know, combined arms effort that we brought together that I, I, I truly believe is going to provide them the best opportunity for success. And it's the, uh, on your first question, uh, typically we're not going to discuss, I don't discuss either prohibitions or permissions, uh, authorities. Uh, on the use of weapons, et cetera. That, that, has, that goes towards rules of engagement. We don't typically discuss those in, in a public forum. On the second question, um, President Biden, uh, President Zelensky, and most of the leaders of Europe have said uh, that this war is likely to end uh, in a negotiation. And, and from a military standpoint, this is a very, very difficult fight. Uh, this fight uh, stretches uh, all the way from right now, so the front line goes from all the way from Kharkiv down to Kyrgyzstan. And, there's significant fighting ongoing, uh, and it's more or less a static front line right this minute, uh, with the exception of Bakhmut and Solidar, with a significant uh, offensive action going on really from both sides. The distance, that for the United States, that's about from, uh, I guess, Washington, D.C. to Atlanta. Uh, so that is a significant amount of territory. And in that territory uh, are still remaining a lot of Russian forces in Russian-occupied Ukraine. So from a military standpoint, I still maintain that for this year, it would be very, very difficult to militarily eject the Russian forces from all, every inch of Ukrainian occupied or uh, Russian occupied Ukraine. Uh, that doesn't mean it can't happen, doesn't mean it won't happen, but it'd be very, very difficult. I think what can happen is a, is a uh, continued uh, defense, uh, stabilizing the front. I think it's possible to, to clearly do that. And I think it's uh, depending on uh, the delivery and training of all of this equipment. I do think it's very, very possible to, for the Ukrainians to run a significant uh, tactical or, or op even operational level offensive operation to liberate as much Ukrainian territory as possible. And then we'll, then we'll see where it goes. But I do think at the end of the day, this war, 
like many wars in the past, will end at some sort of negotiating table. And that'll be determined in terms of timing by the leaders of both countries, uh, both, both uh, Russia and, and Ukraine. Uh, President Putin could end this war today. It, it's, he started it. It's his war of choice, and he could end it today uh, because it's turning into an absolute catastrophe for Russia. Uh, massive amounts of casualties, lots of other damage uh, to, the, to the Russian military, et cetera. Uh, so he should and could end this war right now, right today. Thank you. Our next question will go to Anselm Stern, ZDF. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary, is Germany doing enough in order to show real leadership in Europe? Thank you. Yes, but we can all do more in the uh, you know, United States and every other member of the UDC can, can do more. You know, Germany has contributed a lot to this, uh, to this campaign. Uh, you know, from the very beginning, we, we saw them uh, cycle in uh, air defense capability, uh, the Gepards, uh, the Patriots most recently, IRST. Uh, they've stepped up and offered to provide the martyrs. They will provide the, those martyrs and conduct the training uh, on those platforms. Uh, and um, we are training uh, Ukrainian soldiers on, uh, on maneuver and, and other things uh, and, and specialty things uh, here uh, in Germany as well. So Germany has opened, continues to open its doors and, and make the training areas uh, and facilities available for us to continue to do the work that we need to do. And Germany is also training uh, troops uh, and training uh, battalion and brigade headquarters. So, you know, they have a, a big oar in the water like the rest of the uh, contact group does, uh, and, uh, and they're working hand in hand uh, with, with, uh, with our, the rest of our colleagues here. So I think Idris asked me uh, earlier uh, if, uh, if, if Germany uh, was, uh, was a leader. I, was that the right question there, Idris? Uh, I was, how, how can you see them as a reliable ally? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. They are a reliable ally, and they've been that way for, for a very, very long time, and I, I truly believe that they'll continue to be a reliable ally going forward. Uh, not to mention, uh, they have, uh, Germany is host to 39,000 of my troops and their families, uh, and also 10,000 civilians here. Uh, and, and so we've had a great relationship uh, throughout over the years, and I will continue to have that, uh, that great relationship, and Germany will continue to exercise leadership going forward. So. Thank you. Our next question will go to Dan Lamoth, Washington Post. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, thanks for your time today. Uh, Secretary Austin, a number of lawmakers and observers have said that at this point, it makes sense to send a small number of Abrams tanks, if only to encourage Germany to unlock the Leopard tanks that they have not sent. Is that feasible? And if not, why not? And for the chairman, please, uh, given the amount of armor the United States and allies are sending at this point, how confident are you that they can put together a coherent uh, offensive in the coming months? Uh, to what extent, uh, to the extent you can, what, that, what, what might that look like? And uh, separately, you just refer referenced the large number of casualties. Uh, can you give us any update on, on what you're seeing at this point for casualties on both sides? Thanks. Um, I think you heard the German uh, Minister of Defense say earlier today that there's no linkage between um, providing M1s and providing uh, Leopards. Uh, and I think he was pretty clear about that. So this notion of unlocking, you know, I, in, in, in my mind, is not, it's not an issue. And more importantly, in his mind as well. And in terms of providing capability, uh, what we uh, in, the, in the department always look at is, you know, providing uh, credible combat capability. We, we don't do things uh, to or employ uh, capabilities to, as, as a notion, you know, as a, as, you know for, for anything other than providing credible combat uh, capability. And that's where our focus will be in the, in the future, whatever we do, whatever we uh, employ. So. So, Dan, on the, uh, in order to execute a successful offensive operation at the tactical or operational level, which is really what we're talking about here uh, for the Ukrainians, uh, you've got to uh, not only man the unit, which the Ukrainians have the personnel, uh, but they have to be trained. And so they've got to be married up with the equipment, and then they've got to be trained. Um, and if you look at the weather and terrain, et cetera, um, 
you can see that you have a relatively short window of time to accomplish uh, both those key tasks. So that's very, very challenging to do that uh, for all these different nations that were here today to assemble all of the equipment, get it all synchronized, get, it, get the Ukrainian troops trained, et cetera. Uh, that'll be a very, very heavy lift. Uh, so uh, confident, uh, yes, I think it can be done, uh, but I think that uh, it'll be a challenge. There's no question about it. So we'll see. I don't want to predict one way or the other, but uh, the Ukrainian forces so far have uh, executed uh, at least two and perhaps even more than that very successful offensive operations, one up around Kharkiv, crossing the uh, Ashkil River and, and, and over into, uh, in, in, into uh, uh, the Russian lines to the uh, east of, the, uh, of Kharkiv. And then they've run a very successful operation down in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so it remains to be seen, uh, but the equipment's got to get married up with the people, the people got to get trained on the equipment, and all of that's going to have to get shipped in, into uh, Ukraine, et cetera, all put together uh, inside of a coherent plan. Uh, obviously, General Zaluzzi and, and I and others have uh, uh, discussed uh, what his visions were, not in executable level detail yet, but uh, he's working on that, and, uh, and we'll see which way it goes. Uh, in terms of uh, casualties, you know, the numbers of casualties in war are always uh, suspect. Uh, and, and, uh, but I would tell you that the Russian casualties, uh, last time I reported out on it publicly, I said it was well over 100,000. Uh, I would say it's significantly well over 100,000 now. So the Russians have suffered a tremendous amount of casualties in their, in their military. Uh, and, and that includes their regular military and also their mercenaries in the Wagner Group and, and other type forces that are fighting with the Russians. Uh, they have really suffered a lot. Uh, now you saw that the Russians uh, did a call up of, uh, called out, I think, called up uh, in the mobilization uh, 300,000. I think they were able to get maybe 200, 250,000, something in that range. Uh, so they're replacing their losses in terms of manpower, but they have suffered a huge amount. Uh, Ukraine has also suffered tremendously. You know that uh, there's, there's a significant amount of innocent civilians that have been killed in, as a result of the Russian actions. Uh, the Russians are hitting civilian infrastructure. Uh, there's a significant amount of economic damage, significant amount of damage to the energy infrastructure, and the, Russian, or the uh, Ukrainian military has suffered a significant amount of uh, casualties themselves. So this is a very, very bloody war. And there's significant casualties on both sides. Uh, and this is why I say that uh, I think that uh, at sooner or later, this is going to have to get to a negotiating table at some point uh, in order to bring this to a conclusion. And that will have to happen uh, when the end state, which is a free, sovereign, independent uh, Ukraine with its territory intact, is met. Uh, when that day comes, then people will sit down and negotiate an end to this. Uh, but there's been a huge amount of suffering on both sides. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time we have available today. Mr. Secretary, General Milley, thank you both gentlemen. This concludes our press briefing. Thank you.